it's time again to bring our blessing, to bring a blessing to our God. What mercy he has shown, causing us to be born again, born into a living hope, because our Christ is raised, born into a family, born into a future. Treasure endless and unfading, held in heaven's hands, hands that guard our hearts, hearts that trust in God. Convinced that He will save us, confident He will show Himself, we stand now rejoicing. Even in the trial, our fire-tested faith grows hot, bringing glory to our God. We have never seen Him, and still we love Him. We don't see Him now, and still we rejoice. Joy without words. Joy full of glory. We are being saved, have been saved, will be saved. We bring a blessing now to the Father of our Savior, our one and living hope. Good morning. Welcome to North Shore Fellowship. We are so glad that you decided to join us this morning as we come together to praise the Lord and to survey the text of his word. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we are grateful. Father, for all that you're doing in our lives, we ask that you would bless our time together this morning, that you would encourage us, that we would be inspired and that we would be bold, Lord, and courageous to face the days ahead. Go before us, for we ask it in your mighty name. And we all say together as a church, Amen.
I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, Lord, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Better than you, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing. You turn mourning to dancing You get beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways you're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. For oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Lord, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, your grace so free washes 
devil's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom Wonderful to have you here joining us for our regular Sunday service in times that are anything but regular. Hey, I want to take you through the menu of items that are going on this week, just so you know everything that's happening. First thing we want to make sure you're aware of is that all of the videos for the sermons are posted weekly on our website, NorthShoreNJ.org. At noon today, our youth group that's 11 years old and up will be meeting on Zoom. And at 12.30, the late service watch party will be going on on Facebook. On Wednesday, we go live. We have Wednesday Worship in the Word, which is live with Pastor Raphael and his family. That's at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. On Thursday, the men's ministry will be meeting with Don Hearn. They're also on Zoom, and that'll be at 7.30 p.m. Well, that takes us right back to next Sunday. We want to make sure you're aware of the three things that go on before this broadcast, all on Zoom. At 10 a.m., we have our pre-service prayer meeting, and everyone is welcome to join us for that. At 9.30 in the morning, we have the kids' ministry. Now, this is for 5 to 10-year-olds, and that's on Zoom. And then at 10.15, for the younger kids, we have another Zoom call, and that's pre-K through kindergarten, basically 5 years old and under. And then, of course, at 10.30 is our regular Sunday service, which you can see on Facebook Premiere or on YouTube Premiere. We are sending information out all the time. Melissa and everybody is just getting it out there. Places to look. Check our website. There's all kinds of things posted there. Check our Facebook page. There are invites and, and links there, too. Check your email. You should be seeing a lot of the information coming through there. If you're in need of this information or you have some information that you want to give to us, just use our email at info at northshorenj.org. Hey, in these non-regular times, do your very best to stay safe, stay home, and stay connected. May God bless you all. Well, during this next song, we're going to take our offering. We want to remind you that if you go to the website, you can get details on how to send donations in via the mail. You can do it online. You can also do it by text. If you want to text, you would use the number 732-655-8389 and just simply text the amount and the word GIVE. The link will come back to you that allows you to establish your account, give all the details on that, and you're all set to go. If you are using the text system and you need to change something, an address has changed or something along those lines, use exactly the same number, but you text the word EDIT. You'll get a link and that will allow you to change any of the information that needs to be taken care of. We do want to say thank you to all of you that are uh, being faithful in your tithes and offerings. It's terrific to see the, uh, the funds still coming in. And please know that these funds are used to get the gospel message out. 
And I can't think of a more important time in the history of our nation to get the gospel message out. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come into your presence and we do say thank you. Thank you, Father, that you are with us. Thank you, Father, that you watch over us. Thank you, Father, that you have given us a hope and a salvation. Father, we thank you that you give so much to us that we can give a small portion back to you. And Lord, we ask that you would simply take this money and that you would use it as you see fit. See that your gospel message gets out, that your hands reach out to the people on this earth, that your kingdom is built here. Thank you for including us in your plan and giving us just that little bit that we can give back to you. So, Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Hey Church, let's pray together. God, we are so thankful for your nearness to us during this time. We are thankful, God, that we can gather together in this way and connect with each other. Lord, we are thankful that you have given us your Holy Spirit and your Spirit is holding us together. Lord, we continue to lift up healthcare workers to you, first responders, our leaders, essential workers, and all of those who are suffering and struggling with financial issues. Lord, we lift up the sick among us, Lord. Please, God, bring your healing. And Lord, please bring your comfort to those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we are praying for your peace and your provision for all of those who are in need. We love you, Lord. We trust you. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you need prayer for anything, please reach out to us. You can email us at prayer at northshorenj.org. Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us at North Shore Fellowship. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad all of us are here. Take a deep breath. We are getting through this. God is bringing us through this, friends. I know it's not easy. And uh, it's kind of like a fierce storm that we're all facing together. But remember... We don't have to freak out because Jesus is in the boat and he's not freaking out. And I just want to thank you for being here. And I also want to special, send a special thank you to some of the folks that um, are working really hard, particularly medical personnel and, and hospital personnel who are right there on the front lines, taking care of the sick, handling the, the details of uh, hospital administration. So thank you for that. Also for retail and delivery workers, we can't be we get what we need without you guys, and we so appreciate it. And then also first responders, of which there are many, and you guys have to be ready and have to respond to re emergencies regardless of circumstances. And I am glad that you are doing what you're doing and very grateful for everyone else who's out there working. Thank you. Also want to thank you, North Shore Fellowship, for being faithful in this time with your giving, with your tithes and offerings. You know, we are all about the work that God has given us and it actually has been expanding through this pandemic and God's given us more to do, but you're giving through texts and email and through online giving. Thank you. Please continue that. And I want to tell you that we're starting to formulate plans for what it will be like when we finally come back together. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that. So we're just starting to put pieces of plans and strategies together and we're going to have an all-church meeting on Tuesday, May 5th, at Cinco de Mayo at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And I want you all to come. So get that contact information, the Zoom information. It's online. It's um, available through our emails. So please come and uh, I'll share my vision. We'll get ministry updates. And I really believe that God's going to continue to do what he's doing now, but do greater things as we come out of this and into the near future. So be there for May 5th, Tuesday night. All right, so we're in the middle of this COVID, coronavirus, and it's crazy times. Now, and I don't know about you, but I'm getting a lot of questions from people who are very curious. Sometimes they're a little anxious and very nervous about the things that are going on, and they want a spiritual perspective, and that's a good thing. But I get questions like, is this a biblical plague? Or is this God's judgment? Or is this some type of God's wrath that he's pouring out on the world for something? And, and you know, did God create this virus? Or did it just come through natural causes? Or was it somebody's mistake? Or was it deliberate intentionality of creating this virus for evil? And I don't have all the answers, but these are all good questions because it is predicated on the fact that God is involved somehow. And I want to tell you, that's one question I can answer is, yes, God is involved in everything that we do. But remember, nothing happens unless God makes it happen or lets it happen. So in his sovereignty, in his ultimate wisdom, he has allowed this to happen or perhaps made it happen. Now, God, coronavirus, COVID-19, regardless of what you think about that, it didn't catch God by surprise. In other words, he didn't, it wasn't like a big whoops and he wasn't powerless to prevent it. He is still on the throne and he is sovereign. Now, this is hard to understand, especially for those of you who have lost loved ones or, or you have friends or family that are sick. I know it's really hard to understand. How is God involved? Now, these are questions that have prevailed through history. They're called questions of theodicy. Theodicy, how could God allow good 
and evil to take place? And why? How could they both exist? And once again, we don't know God's mind. We don't have a, an inside track onto what God is thinking for every decision that he makes. In fact, in scripture, we see disclaimers throughout scripture that say, you know, you don't, are, are not going to be able to figure out the mind of God. You don't know his ways. But we do know scripture. And there's a lot about God in the scripture. And so when we look to scripture, we get to know about God. And let, let me just take you through, through some scripture. Like Romans 11, 33 and 34, it says this, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Obviously, it's a rhetorical question. No one knows the mind of the Lord. And there's no one that God goes to for counseling. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, we cannot fully know the mind of the Lord. We can't know his thoughts. We can't know what drives his thinking. But we do know about God, as I said, through scripture. And we see him demonstrate through scripture his will, his will. You see, in theology, God's will is described in several different ways. And it's like a spectrum of different descriptions about God's will from his decorative will, the things that he decreed will come to pass, to his permissive will on the other end of the spectrum, the things that he permits to take place. And all of these are consistent with his sovereignty. What's his sovereignty? Is that he is God. His purposes will be achieved because they are his will. God's will be done. In other words, he allows, you get this, he allows ungodliness to take place sometimes to ultimately bring about his will. I know it sounds strange, but we see it in scripture. Look at the story of Joseph. If you don't know, the story of Joseph and his brothers is in Genesis. And Joseph was maligned by his brothers who were so jealous of him. In fact, his jealous brothers decided they're going to just kill him and throw him in a pit. Instead, they lightened up a little bit and they decided to sell him into slavery and then go back to their dad who favored him and say, oh, he died. Now, it doesn't get much more evil than that. We'll pick it up in Genesis 50 and listen to what Joseph says about that whole ordeal based on what we just talked about. Genesis 50, 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. You see, you meant evil and God allowed you to do this evil against me, Joseph says, in order to bring about good to save people. Wow. And that's interesting for Joseph to say, but what about COVID-19? How does that relate to what we're experiencing today? Because we can clearly see that God allowed this to take place. He could have stopped it. He didn't yet. He could still. He's God. He could do whatever he wants. But is it a biblical plague? Is this God's judgment? Is this some type of wrath or punishment that God is pounding upon the world for some reason? Bible plagues, wrath, punishment, judgment. Let's take a look at those words and see what they actually mean. For instance, a biblical plague. A lot of people have asked me, is this a biblical plague? Okay, well, it's not a plague that's in the Bible because the Bible is not being written now, but there may be, it may be a plague like what was in the Bible. I think that's really the question. But I don't think it fits the model, at least of the plagues in Egypt that we see during the time of Moses or even other plagues that took place throughout the Old Testament where a prophet would declare and predict from the Lord that this is what God is going to do and this is the purpose of the plague and it was to bring the children of Israel back to him. I don't see that it totally fits that description. Um, but others will say, well, maybe it's not that, but what about the crazy, strange, wild book of Revelation? It's filled with all kinds of plagues and bowls of wrath and so forth. And so I looked at that. Now, in Revelation 6, we see something takes, take place 
And that's where the, the four seals are broken and the horsemen are released on the earth. And the one horse, the fourth horse, is actually the pale horse. And his rider brings forth death in many ways. And in this case, the, the fourth horse in Revelation 6 brings forth famine and sword and wild beasts and plagues. However, a quarter of the population of the world dies as a result. Now, unless this thing gets really worse, really, really worse, really bad, it won't even compare to some plagues that have gone on a hundred years ago. And it won't be compared to the loss of life that was experienced during uh, the Holocaust. So if those were not fulfillment of Revelation 6, then this probably is not. Some people may think it is, but most don't think it is. But later in the book of Revelation, we see more plagues being born, poured out. And that's when uh, the bowls of wrath are poured out. That's Revelation 15 and 16. And once again, it doesn't fit the eschatological, eschatological timeline because this is after the, the beast is established. And so I don't see the coronavirus in my mind, through my study of scriptures, and most people concur, as a fulfillment of an apocalyptic plague. So if it's not that, then what is it? Well, I suppose we could still look at whether or not this is God's judgment or wrath or some type of punishment. And you look at those things, those words like God's judgment or his wrath or punishment. They're scary words, but I think we need to look at them because they are real words that we see in the Bible. You see God's judgment that shows up from time to time. And there's many uses of this word judgment in the Bible for this, in this type of situation. It's based on the Hebrew word mishpat, mishpat. And that's the same word, really. It's judgment. It's also used for, in, in many cases, for judgment, justice. So judgment, justice, mishpat in, in Hebrew. And what is justice? Ah, justice is basically to set things right. If God executes judgment or justice, he's basically putting things right that were wrong. Okay? So, you think about like our Supreme Court. We have Supreme Court justices. And what they do is they interpret the law and they bring forth a judgment to set right which is wrong according to the law. Now, if, if this is judgment from God, if this is judgment for God, we know it's a matter of setting things right. That's the purpose. It's called rectitude, making that which is wrong back to being right. You know, a lot of people look at God's judgment as God just gets madder and madder and madder. And then he loses his temper and just starts throwing fireballs at the earth. You know, this is not what is taking place. This is not God's judgment. God's judgment is basically making that which is wrong, making that which is incorrect, making that which is imbalanced back to balance, back to right and back to correct. But there are other words that are applied in situations that seem like there's wrath and, and God's judgment upon the earth. Like, for instance, punishment. We look at the word punishment. Now, punishment and wrath are oftentimes based on the same word. There's a complex array of words for these uh, two phrases throughout the Old Testament. So they're not as close as we saw with Mishpat, but they are close. So in many instances in the Old Testament, God will, uh, the writer will use the word punishment or wrath. And it's usually to bring consequence because of disobedience and bring back correction, bringing about justice like we saw before, making things right. So let's look at COVID-19. If, I'm saying if, if God were to use COVID-19, this coronavirus, as punishment to bring about justice on the earth, why would he do it? That's the big question. If it's true, and I can't say if it is not, you know, I'm not, who can know the mind of the Lord who has been his counselor? Certainly not me. But if it is, why? Why would he do it? What would motivate him to stop us in our tracks, <laughs> to make us slow down, to return to a simpler life, to focus on what and who is important in our life, instead of allowing us to pursue this maddening, endless pursuit of comfort and happiness and pleasure full bore all the time, every day, 
Why would he stop us? Why would he do it? What would cause him to make us cease from worshiping things like money and sports and entertainment and lavish freedom for a period of time? Why would he do that? Why? You know, he's supposed to be a good, good father. We call him our heavenly father, our everlasting father. He's supposed to be a good, good father. Why would he make or allow this to happen? Isn't a heavenly father always supposed to you know, make everything happy for his children? Isn't that his job and his purpose? Listen, I can't speak for God, but I can speak for myself because I'm a dad. I consider myself a good, good father. And I can share my experiences of fatherhood. See, there's times when I have to exercise judgment, even punishment. Now, I suppose some people could consider that wrath, but I'm not too strict. But I consider myself a kind and gentle and understanding, compassionate father. So why would I exercise judgment? I don't like to do it. I don't like to mete out punishment. I love my children. That's the key. I love my children very much. And and I want them to be safe. And I want them to be healthy. And I want them to be well taken care of and well provided for. And if I feel and see and perceive that they're developing destructive habits or dangerous behaviors, I'll do my best to get their attention. And once I get their attention, I will bring correction. Why? Because I love them. Listen to what Hebrews 12, 6 says. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes each one he accepts as his child. The Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes those he accepts as a child. Does that seem counterintuitive? Well, not really. See, the worst thing that we could ever do as parents, I'm speaking to you parents, is to never discipline our children. I mean, think about that. What if we just didn't do anything? What if we didn't care if they ever washed or brushed their teeth? What if we allowed them to eat whatever they want, whenever they want, and and go to bed whenever they felt like it or not? (laughs) What if we didn't insist that they learn anything to read and write or anything else? Just if you don't want to learn, you don't learn. And you know what? You can go out and play wherever you want to go out, roam around, wander, come back whenever or not at all. I mean, would that be good parenting? What if we just gave them a few rules and, and some guidelines and some regulations? And if they didn't follow them, just never really mention it. No consequence. Would that be good parenting? Would that show love for our children? You know the answer to that. No. It would be easy. It'd be easy on us because we wouldn't have to exert any effort towards parenting. But it would be the opposite of love. You know, love by definition is to will the highest good for the other regardless of self. So you know this as parents or anyone who's loved someone that you had to take care of. You'll do anything for them regardless of what it means to you. If you love someone, you'll go through extreme efforts to take care of them, to provide for them, to make sure they're okay, and not just okay, but their life is great. That's what it means to love. See, the coronavirus is very serious, and I I don't want to take it lightly because it's created a lot of hardship and heartache for a lot of people. But, But listen, once again, we know that nothing happens including this, unless God makes it happen or lets it happen. Now, I can't say for certain that this coronavirus is definitely God's discipline, God's judgment on the world for obvious reasons. I mean, we're growing more distant from God. There's a permeating godlessness that exists in society throughout the entire world. Pockets of goodness, but lots of permeating godlessness. Now, If it was God's judgment, if it was, it would be because he loves us. (laughs) He loves the people of the world enough to want to get their attention, to get our attention. You know, I was in prayer this week and I asked the Lord, like, if you're trying to get the world's attention, you've done it. I've never seen anything like this. So, but why do you even care? I mean, my hardened heart, you know. Like, why do you even care? The world's getting worse and worse and it's going to get worse and worse. And, you know, men's hearts will grow cold and there'll be increasing wickedness, just like Matthew 24. Jesus even said it. And so let it get worse. Let them just stew in their own devices and suffer and then just take us out of it and then we'll be good. 
Why wouldn't you just do that? Why would you, if you're trying to get their attention, why? Why? And then he reminded me that he loves the world. He hasn't given up on them. He hasn't given up on us. He wills none to perish. Yeah, I think about the story of Jonah. Jonah was his prophet. God said, I want you to go to the evil city of Nineveh and bring them my message. And he's like, no. Nineveh was way to the northeast. And you know what Jonah did? He set out to the northwest and got on a boat to go the opposite direction out of Joppa. And God, you know, did the whole thing with the belly of the fish and that whole ordeal and brought him to Nineveh. And, And here's what God says about why he would even care about a godless society. Here's what he says. Jonah 4.11, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? Should I not have concern? Many versions will say, should I not have shown compassion? You see, God has compassion on the world just like he had compassion on the evil city of Nineveh. And he'll go to great lengths to reach them, to stop them, to show them that he cares about them. And it very well could be that that's what's happening in this day and age that you and I are experiencing as eyewitnesses. You know, Jesus was the same way. He would go to people he knew were godless, who he knew would likely reject him or never really thought of him. And he tries best to reach out to them. In fact, in our journey of Mark, uh, where we we left Mark chapter four last week, we see this taking place at the beginning of Mark chapter five. So in our journey, eyes on Jesus, which is keeping our eyes on Jesus, because when things get crazy around you, the best thing you could ever do, focus, focus, focus on Jesus. We do that through reading the word, specifically through the gospel. So we're jumping back on track here with Mark chapter five. And here's what it says. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. That's also known as the Gadarenes, depending on which version. It's right across the Galilee from uh, where they were mostly dwelling in Capernaum and and the other areas. Uh, It's right across towards the Golan Heights. Verse two, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When Jesus saw him from a distance, he saw Jesus from a distance. He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want from me? And Jesus son, of, Jesus, son of the Most High, don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. You see, he addressed that which was within him, an impure spirit, not necessarily the man himself. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many, meaning many demons. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. You see, this man is pleading, the demons within him are pleading Jesus for mercy. This man is, a, is possessed by a legion of demons. Verse 11, a large herd of, fi- of pigs was feeding on the ner- nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. (laughs) Those who had seen it told the people what had happened in the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Wow, what a story. You see, this is right after the whole thing where they got in the boat and they were crossing over and Jesus was sleeping in the boat and a fierce storm came and Jesus calmed the water and they continued on the journey. And this is what happened when they got to the other side. 
Now, the reason Jesus got into the boat in the first place was likely because he knew what he was about to do in the Gadarenes. And to, when these apostles saw this crazy demon-possessed man, it was probably like, you know, it was probably uh, pale. Uh, the, that storm that they experienced probably paled in comparison to this man who's breaking chains, breaking iron, cutting himself, living amongst the tombs, shouting out with Jesus, to Jesus, filled with a legion of demons. Now, this is in... A Gentile city. Clearly, we know this because of what? Oink, oink. There's pigs. No pigs in any of the Jewish towns and cities Jesus has been in. This is a city that's part of the Decapolis, which is a series of 10 Roman cities that people would travel to one to the next as they went through the Roman region. And this is Gadarenes or Gerasenes, depending on what version you're reading. And there's a legion of demons inside this man. And Jesus shows something. And this is really important for spiritual warfare. He shows that he has authority over the demonic. They were begging Jesus for mercy. You know, he shows that these demons could not do whatever they wanted. They were subject to Jesus' authority. We read in James 2.19 that demons tremble at the thought of the one true God. They're afraid of us as we are filled with the Spirit of God. They, Jesus did have a dialogue with the, this demonic legion. And he permitted them, he permit, gave them permission to enter into a herd of 2,000 pigs at their request. So this shows something, doesn't it? It shows God's judgment on these demons. It also shows his permissive will. You know, was it God's de decorative will that these pigs be filled with demons? I not necessarily sure I would say that, but there's a permissive will in play here as well. As a result of this action, Jesus permitting this to take place, <laughs> this little village of Gerasenes, Gadarenes, turned into a place where there was a crazy wild man to a place where there's 2,000 demon-possessed pigs running around. I'm not sure which is worse. Eventually, the pigs ran off a cliff and they ended up drowning in the lake. Okay, hopefully well on the other side of the lake where the Jewish guys were fishing, very much so. So these 2,000 pigs are gone. The townspeople finally get there. They hear about the commotion that took place. They may have seen some uh, floating pork corpses in the water. But Mark 5.15 says this, When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Doesn't that strike you as kind of odd? You see, they were used to seeing this crazy demon man breaking chains, shouting, cutting himself in tombs, and instead they see this guy, he's mild-mannered now, he's well-behaved, he's peaceful, he's well-dressed, he's sitting with Jesus, he's talking, and they're afraid. You see, they were afraid of the power of God. I'm not sure if they were demon-possessed as well, but Whatever was in them was converse, was contrary to what was in Jesus and this person. Mark 5, 18 through 20, these verses that follow. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. There's a lot of begging going on in this story. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, those 10 cities, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. I would be too. All the people were amazed. You see, he wanted to go with Jesus. And Jesus wasn't rejecting him. He was commissioning him. Now, this is not a rejection. It's a commission. It's to go and tell. It's what Jesus wanted him to do. The man obviously would have liked to leave that spot leave his past wicked reputation behind and just go be part of a new life with Jesus and his apostles wherever they were going to go. But that is not what Jesus intended for him. What Jesus intended for him to do was to go back to the people that knew him and knew of him and tell them of the greatness of what God has done for you and how he's shown mercy upon you. And he did that. And he went around sharing his shining testimony and people were amazed. Wow. You know, sometimes as Christians, we want to disassociate ourselves with the people in our past. 
Now, it's important to do that for people that are toxic, people that are, are detriment to our, our sometimes our early Christians fragile faith. But there comes a time where those people are our are field of harvest. Those are our vineyard to work. But that's our herd of sheep to, to lead and to share the good things of God. And I believe that sometimes disassociating and hiding from them is the wrong thing to do. I believe God wants us to go and tell, go and tell of the great things that God has done for us. You know what? In this time, in this lockdown, it's hard to go and tell anything to anybody because nobody's seeing each other. But you know what? We are. We're giving glimpses of our life to each other that n- never took place before. People are looking into your your videos, your what you're looking at online. I mean, I know social media is kind of taking preeminence. It's probably the time for that if there ever was one. But in that, you could share what's the good news of the gospel in your life, a regenerated life. I'm just like you. I have friends from high school and college and others, uh, people of the past that I'm back in touch with. I'm glad to be. I'm glad to, to tell them of the good things that God is doing in my life and offer that to them in their life as well. I hope that you're doing that. You know, we can share our testimony through emails, through through social media. We can share online more than ever before. You can invite people to church from all around the world and all they have to do is exactly what you did this morning. And hopefully they can hear of the good news of God and how he loves them and wants to reconcile them into a relationship with him through Jesus, our savior. Our, our friend Dylan, he he asked me if uh, he could do a, a, a song for Seabright Acoustic Cafe a video, we were putting some stuff together, and he did a testimony in a song. His testimony was fantastic. His song was brilliant. He shared that, and hundreds of friends, some old friends that knew him in the past, are responding and being getting back in touch and hearing the good news. That is what I'm talking about. Share your shining testimony with people who desperately need to hear it. And that's really what we're doing here. Our church gets regular visitors now from people all over the world, simply because someone invited them, simply because someone said, I've I've found some good news and I just want to share it with you. There's nothing offensive. There's nothing invasive about that. So I see this whole thing as not a big mistake. I'm not willing to say God is judging the world because of such and such. But I do know this, that he doesn't do anything arbitrarily. God is not arbitrary. Everything has intent. Everything has purpose. There's no coincidences. And I've seen great things happening. I see God bringing people out of the darkness into his marvelous light because of what's being squeezed out of us because of COVID-19. So the message today, don't give up on others because God has not given up on them. He loves the world and he wants the world to be reconciled to him. So it could be that he allowed this disruption to happen so that more people would stop and listen and seek him and be saved. And if that's true, if that's true, let's all be part of that plan. God bless you.
Yes, pour out your spirit. We love to be near you. Friends, thank you so much for joining us at North Shore Fellowship. I hope that you enjoyed the service today. If you did, why don't you share it with somebody? You can easily do that by just sharing this video. And I hope that you're experiencing the joy of the Lord. But if you're feeling alone, if you're not feeling God's peace, please reach out to us. Let us pray with you. If there's anything we could do to help you in this time, please reach out to us. If you've never committed your life to Jesus, if you've never said, yes, Jesus, be my Lord, today's the perfect day for that. Contact us in any way and allow us to usher you into a prayer of salvation and start the best part of your life and on into eternity. I hope that you're having a great day. We look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night or any of our small groups. Please stay in touch with us and know that God is near to you. God bless you.